So, as Pastor Rod said, we are going to be in part two of the life of Paul, um, from Saul to Paul, a life devoted to God. So, two weeks ago, I kind of set the stage on, on Paul's life, on how he got up to the point of being Paul, from Saul. And so, um, today what we're going to go over is kind of what happened after that conversion, after that transition from, from Saul to Paul. And we talked a little bit about how, um, how he was going to have to suffer. And Jesus specifically told Ananias that he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. And we, we read that and we go, oh my goodness, he's going to have to suffer. And Jesus is saying that he's going to have to suffer. If Jesus is saying that it's going to be suffering, then you know it's going to be real, legitimate suffering. And so that's some of the stuff that I wanted to talk about today a little bit. Um, and, and I wanted you guys to be thinking about what sets Paul apart from us today, from uh, our, our mindset, from the way that we live our lives, from the way that we perceive this relationship with God, our religion, if you will, our Christianity. What, what is it that, that makes him different? Um, is it his humanity? Is he any different than us and our makeup with our DNA and everything? No, of course not. He was just a person. He suffered things. He got sick. He had all kinds of, of different emotions and stuff like that. So essentially, he was very, very, very much just like you and me. He was a real, legitimate, live person that really, truly did have an absolute encounter with Jesus Christ. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. But I think one of the main things that, that we're missing here is the fact that, that Paul, he wasn't fixated on the things of this world. And I'm not trying to say that you are or that I am, but I, I can guarantee you that I'm a lot more fixated on my creature comforts than Paul was. I mean, 100%. And no matter how good somebody had it back then, we have it so much better. Here, we have it so much better. We have plumbing, for one. Thank you, Jesus. We have better beds than 100 years ago. My bed is better than the best bed any king could possibly have right now. And it's not that great. I mean, it's pretty good, but it's not that great. But it's still better than anything they ever had. You know? Air conditioning. Where did these guys live? You know? They walked everywhere. They didn't have a BMW, Steve. They couldn't just jump on a bike. It was a camel. Lucky you. Exactly. Lucky us. We've got all these creature comforts. But the thing is, Paul wasn't fixated on any of that. He just straight up didn't care. When Jesus said, go, he went. We'll get into some of the, some of the interesting parts of that. But another thing is that... that Paul understood that, that life is a vapor, like James said. James, the brother of Jesus. If you guys haven't seen Michael Jr.'s little uh, skit on James, the brother of Jesus, Michael Jr. is a comedian, Christian comedian. He's hilarious. Um, but you've got to go check it out. But he spent some time with James. Now, last week we talked a little bit about how whenever he... He had his conversion. He went right into uh, teaching and stuff like that. He was actually spent about three years in Arabia before he came back into Jerusalem. But when he did come back, he spent time with Peter and James and John. And um, so in James, James 4.14 is the one that specifically stated that our life is but a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. He's telling us, don't don't hold on to your life so much. Don't love it so much that you're not willing to step out and do the things that God has called you to do. And Paul took him seriously. I think that the time that he spent with James um, definitely helped him to understand those things, definitely helped him to grasp it. Um, 
But I think that Paul was kind of really on that journey anyway. But some other attributes that Paul had is he was fully in love with God. You know, we talked about how the fact that whenever he was 13 years old, he goes and trains in Jerusalem under the, the top dog. Um, and I personally believe that he wanted to do that because he excelled in everything. So he had this relationship with God from his parents, from them, from a very early age. And he raised up um, just in that, that desire to know God and to be known by God. It was his heart's desire. It was his passion. And so that was something that, um, that I think that, that we can get really um, sidetracked on all the busyness that goes on, whether it's work and, and, and taking care of this and taking care of that and running here and doing that. We're so busy these days. And, and his, his heart's desire was to get more of God, to know more of God. I remember whenever I very first started to really dive into the Word. Brittany and I had went through some really hard struggles and stuff. She was praying for me, and God was truly starting to soften my heart. And the more that I got in, the more I wanted. And then the more I got in, the more I wanted. And so it just kept growing and growing and growing. And people are like, well, you know, I just... I just don't know. I'm not feeling it. I'm not there with God. You know, we, we don't have that kind of relationship. If you are in that situation and you're, you have those feelings or thoughts or you experience those things, it's because you're not seeking him more. Just seek him more. And he's going to put that desire deep down inside you like a, like a fire shut up in your bones. And then you're going to be like me dancing all around and, and in worship and can't hold still. Speaking about worship, I do want to just take a little quick side note. When I remember whenever I was younger and I first like got out of the Marine Corps or even before that, whenever I was a kid and I was in um, church growing up as a teenager and stuff, I always felt like everybody was watching me. Now I look back and go, that's a pretty conceited thought. Why would everybody be watching you? They're not, <laughs> you know? Um, and so... So I had such a hard time even putting my hands up, even if I wanted to worship, if I wanted to get um, excited and really get into uh, just worshiping and praising God. I had such a hard time because I had fear of, of man and what other people thought. But I, I just want to tell you guys, this church, uh, even the first day, like I said, at the Bibles and Brunch, we're in there worshiping up on the screen. And I, like, I look back and everybody's just worshiping. You know, that just, oh man, it just pleases my heart so much because just like that song was talking about that, that he goes before us and all we have to do is stand still. All we have to do is praise. All we have to do is worship. You realize that um, back in the Old Testament, whenever the armies of Israel were going into battle, they put their worshipers ahead. They put their worshipers ahead. That makes no sense at all. That's like putting the Marine Corps band in front of the Marines. You know what I mean? Bad move. <laughs> hey, every Marine's a rifleman, but I just, I don't see it. <laughs> but God had a purpose for that. You know, God would tell them exactly what to do, when to do it, how to do it, through the prophets, through the people that wanted to spend time with him consistently. To hear his words that wanted to, that were willing to. You know, God would ask them questions. He'd give, he'd give a prophet a vision and say, what do you see? And Elijah's like, I see this. And he's like, good, you're right. And then he'd finish telling him whatever he wanted to tell him. Isn't that nuts? That's crazy. I love it. But, um, but we have that same ability, guys. We actually have more of that ability because we have the Holy Spirit. God's spirit dwelling inside of us to be able to hear him, to be able to follow him, to be able to listen and do what he tells us to do when he tells us to do it, if we're willing to listen. And you know, one of my devotions, I don't know if, if, uh, if any of you um, like really get into devotions and stuff like that, but I've got a really cool one by Oswald Chambers, and I have to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to me sometimes what he's saying because it's so deep and I'm just not that deep. And, but um, my devotion for today was talking about what do you do in the silence? What do you do whenever Jesus 
is quiet. And Oswald puts this spin on it and says, you are the one that's being blessed at this point because God trusts you, because he's getting ready to take you to another level, because he's getting ready to reveal to you. He's basically laying it out saying anybody can ask for something, and if they know that they're going to get it, they're going to get it. But it's whenever he puts, your, he puts your faith to the test, whenever he's quiet, and you still just rest in his peace, and you just love on him, and you let him love on you. That's whenever he's doing this work inside of you that's going to build your trust for the bigger things that are to come. And I'm telling you, we all have bigger things to come. All of us, every single person sitting in here or watching online, everybody has something bigger to come if you're willing to get it. So with Paul, I think one of the great things is Paul knew he didn't deserve anything. One of his his struggles, I would assume, is the fact that he knew where he came from. He knew the things that he had done, especially after he encounters Jesus and Jesus asking, Paul, why are you, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, he knew all this stuff. And then he comes into this one-on-one relationship with him. And now he knows he, he doesn't deserve the gifts and the awesome things that he's got, but he knows that God has given him such a gift, such a, a calling on his life that he could not deny it. Every one of us has a calling on our lives that we can't deny. We try, but we can't deny it. And if we're willing to let God use us like Paul did, then you're going to see your life drastically change. Drastically change. I remember Scott talking a while back about how he knows that God has called him to, um, to speak, to speak to people. No, you do. You do. You go out and you do speak to everybody that you come in contact with. You know, as you keep maturing that, as you keep growing that, God's going to take you and put you in front of so many people. So many people. But one of the great things is you don't have to be standing up here doing what I'm doing. You just have to do what God's telling you to do. And that's exactly what what Paul did. We can't all be Paul. Thank goodness. You're going to find out why that wouldn't be so great here in a minute. But God's called you to be you and do what he's called you to do specifically. So here's another great thing about Paul. He didn't have any preconceived ideas that following Christ would be easy. But how many of us have come into a church or, or come into any kind of situation where we're like, how can God let, let this happen to me? Why would God let this happen to me? He didn't have any preconceived ideas that, this, that that was what he was coming into, that he would give his life to Jesus, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's uh, peaches and cream. It's nice and rosy. There's nothing bad. Everything's good. God makes everything perfect for me right here, right now. No, that's not the case. We have, we, we are striving for the upward call in Christ Jesus. We're striving for what he has for us on the other side. But Paul even calls it a race. I've ran the good race of faith. I've fought the good fight of faith. I've won the prize, but he didn't get there easily. Even Jesus in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus says, anyone who comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You don't get a vacation from it. If, you're, if we collectively are going after Jesus Christ and we're going after this faith, this truth, this hope, this love that we know is real, then daily... We have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after him. The cross, whenever Jesus was saying this, it's not the pretty little cross necklace or, you know, a a cross that we see up on the wall. It was a symbol of absolute torture, absolute torture and ultimately death. You didn't get on the cross and then get off the cross and go about your business. You died, period. There was no coming off the cross. So this is, this is a, a figurative picture that Jesus Christ himself is using. 
You have to lay yourself completely aside, take up this, this thing. It, it's going to be a burden for you. It's going to, and follow after me. But he didn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there with you. He doesn't stop there with me. There is hope. There is the future. There is the resurrection. There is eternal life where there is no weeping, no sorrow, no tears, none of that. That's what we're looking forward to. And this life, like I said in James, it's just a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. So, so this little tiny speck of time that we have to um, lay ourselves aside, Jesus tells us that the first will be last and the last will be first. If you deny yourself and you serve, you will be exalted. If you exalt yourself here, you're going to be humbled, which is pretty rough. Matthew 10, 22, it says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Does anybody in here want to be hated by everybody? No, of course not. And in here... You're loved by all of us, but there's places in this earth right now where you could go, like we were talking about, that you can go and you'll be hated by everybody there. Absolutely. There are so many of those places, not because of who you are, but because of the way you look, where you come from, all these things, not because of, of your thoughts, not because you love somebody or don't love somebody, no matter what, you'd be hated. And Jesus tells us right here, these are descriptions of what it's going to be like to be a Christian. So Paul didn't have any preconceived ideas here. John 16, says, I have told you these things so that in my name you may have peace. Jesus gives us the peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding. But Jesus then goes on to say, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And that's, those are the exact things that Paul was holding on to that allowed him to move forward and do the amazing things in Christ Jesus' name that he did. It's the very same thing that we can hold on to, the name of Jesus Christ, the peace that surpasses all understanding. In order to do the things that he's called us to do, you don't have to do it in your own power. In fact, you can't do it in your own power. I promise you 100%. You absolutely can't, but you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength, right? So let's listen to some of the things that, that uh, Paul had to go through in order to fulfill the ministry that, that God had called him to. Remember, Jesus said to Ananias, he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. Now, this account that I'm getting ready to read to you it takes place in 2 Corinthians 11, 23, and then follows all the way down through, through 12, pretty much. But 2 Corinthians was written at about 56 AD. And it was roughly, historians believe that it was, it was roughly like halfway through Paul's, his, his life devoted to Christ after his conversion. So it's, it's the second book that he wrote to the, Corinthians, to the Corinthians in 56 AD. So if it's only halfway through, if it's only halfway through and this is the stuff that he's had to deal with so far, man, that's, that's pretty rough. I, let's look into it. He says that he has worked harder than pretty much anybody else, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number. So many times, he can't even count how many times he's been whipped. Everywhere he went, he got whipped, it seems like. Everybody's wanting to whip Paul. <laughs> he gets whipped so many times. He's faced death again and again. He says five different times, five different times, guys, he received from the Jewish leaders 39 lashes, the whips that literally shredded his skin. They didn't go to 40, right, due to Jewish law. But this was from the Jewish leaders. Some manuscripts say 40 minus one, he got whipped. This is five different times. I can't even wrap my head around 
the extreme, excruciating pain of this. I mean, that will take a person to the absolute brink of death because of loss of blood, because of the sheer trauma of it. And it happened five different times by the Jewish leaders, by the people that he grew up under, that he was raised up under, that he was one of the very best of. They were the ones that did that to him. He says, three times, I was beaten with rods. That's no fun. It's probably better than the five times he got the 39 lashes. But he says he was even stoned once. He was shipwrecked three times and spent an entire night and day adrift at sea. I bet, I bet that while he was drifting around out there at sea, wondering if he's going to get eaten by a shark or something like that, if you guys have ever watched any of the shows like I Shouldn't Be Alive or something like that, you know, where people are floating around out in the ocean, that's a scary place to be. And he's there for all night and all day just floating after he's been shipwrecked several times. That's nuts. This guy, he had to have been thinking, really, God? Are you sure you want me right here, right now? Did I hear you correctly? How many of us, I can, I can attest that I can imagine that after that first time that I took the 39 lashes, I probably wouldn't be speaking up quite so much anymore. But he just keeps going back. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He just doesn't stop. Why doesn't he stop? So he's been floating in the ocean for a night and a day. He's traveled on many long journeys, he says. And then he says that he's faced danger in the cities, danger in the deserts, danger in the seas, dangers from rivers and from robbers, and from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles and from men who claim to be believers but are not. They claim to be believers but are not. He faced danger from them. He literally writes it down in here. He worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. He's been hungry and thirsty and often went without food. He shivered in the cold without enough clothes to keep him warm. This guy, this is only halfway through his ministry. And he just keeps going. What keeps pushing him on? It's the experience, like what we talked about last two weeks ago. It's the experience that he had. He couldn't shake it. You couldn't beat it out of him. You couldn't whip it out of him. You couldn't stone it out of him. Nothing could take it away from him. He had to move on. He understood what his purpose was, what his calling was. Nothing was going to stop this dude until he was dead. And it looked like that almost happened several times. He says, and... and He's talking here, he's talking about all the different things that he's gone through, the different things that he's achieved, the different things that he has done for the name of Jesus Christ. But he says, but if I must boast, I'd rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. How weak I am? Who in here wants to go around telling people about how weak they are? About the... The, the bad things that they've done, the things that they can't overcome in their lives, the things that they constantly are like, why in the world am I still doing this? He says, I'm going to boast in my weaknesses because in my weaknesses, God is made strong. God's strength is shown through that. He says, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Get this a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times, I begged the Lord, he says. This servant of Paul begged the Lord three different times to take this, this thorn in his flesh, whatever it was that was a messenger from Satan, he says. He begged God to take it away from him. But each time, each time that he was begging, this is what, this is what Jesus said. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. You know what I relate that to? I relate that to the fact that if it's something that you can do on your own, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody knows, well, Nathan can do that. 
Why, why, would, why would we think that that's something amazing? It's not amazing. He does it all the time. What's the big deal? No, what the big deal is, is whenever God does something through you that you could never do, that you could never accomplish on your own. That's where Jesus says, my grace, my grace is all you need. In your weakness, I'm going to make you strong. In your weakness, I'm going to show how strong I am because of the things that I'm doing through you. All of us have that ability. All of us have that capability. All of us have that right there, right there. All we have to do is take it. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness, Paul says, and in the insults, the hardships, the persecution, and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong, he says. He knew that. He understood that. He accepted it. He accepted. I'm not perfect. I'm not. But I am made perfect through Christ Jesus, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice. Now I'm perfect. It's something that, that if we grab a hold of that, guys, it will absolutely change our lives. Something else that he had to, um, that he had to endure was the fact that in 2 Timothy 1.15, there were, there were tons of people that rejected him, but he says, as you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me. He says that in 2 Timothy. This was about 65 AD, and it was one of the last for sure known letters that he wrote in 2 Timothy. He says that all the people from Asia have deserted me. Have you ever felt like you've been left alone? Like even though you helped somebody, you went and helped them move. And now whenever you're moving, they're not here to help you move. It's like, you know what? I've helped everybody move. Nobody come to help me move. It's, it's one of those deals where no matter what, no matter what you've done for, for all these people, they don't appreciate it. They don't, they don't want to repay it. They don't want to pay it forward for you, you know? And that's one of the, the things that he dealt with here. Paul loved so deeply Loved people so much, poured his life into so many people. I just read all the things that he had gone through. Imagine you go through all that stuff for somebody. And they're like, nah, no, nah, they just turn their back on you. He did it because he knew the love of Jesus Christ. He knew that Jesus Christ had already done all that for him and more. All that and more. Paul couldn't take anybody's sins away. But Jesus took his sins away. Paul couldn't guarantee somebody to spend forever with him in eternity, but Jesus could and Jesus did. Did that for him, somebody that absolutely didn't deserve it, and did it for you and me. And we certainly don't deserve it. But that's what kept him pushing on. You know, um, the Philippians, Philippi, one of, the, one of the coolest things, I think, is that Philippi, is a colony made up of retired Roman soldiers. Retired Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers at the time were the absolute elite, most ruthless fighting force in the world. I mean, they literally created tactics that we still use today. Their armor, their battle, the way that they fought... They were the ones that hung Jesus on that cross. They were the ones that were whipping him brutally. Anybody seen The Passion of the Christ? Horrific. Um, great movie. Makes me cry. But those are the guys. And Paul goes to those guys. Paul goes to Philippi. He calls them his friends. They even take one of their own Roman soldiers, retired Roman soldier, Give him money to take to Paul whenever he's in Rome and in prison to help him for his needs, you know? It's like being in law enforcement. If, if somebody really needs help, they need somebody that's in law enforcement that can help within that circle, you know? And so they take one of their own and they send him to Rome. But what's wild and crazy is that here's Paul in chains in Rome with Roman soldiers in Caesar's home, essentially, and he's still ministering 
to all these people and still winning, winning people to Christ. It's amazing. But you have to know and understand that for Paul to emotionally and psychologically be able to go into Philippi, that would be, that'd be like going into, um, you, you almost know it's going to be a war zone. You know, you almost know, well, going to get beat again. Well, <laughs> going to get whipped again, you know, but he still goes. It's amazing. It's crazy. Ultimately, Paul ended up being martyred for his faith in Christ. He was ultimately killed for his faith in Christ. However, because he was a Roman citizen, he could not be crucified like Peter was. He couldn't be crucified. So we don't know absolutely 100% how he died. Most people think that he got his head cut off. He probably did. I don't know. But whatever it was, I'm sure it was brutal. I'm sure it was brutal because everything they did back then was brutal. So why did Paul go through all this? Acts 9.15 says that Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to, and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. This is God's words right here. This is why Paul was selected. He had everything that Jesus wanted to use to be able to minister to these people. Saul is my, my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. Whenever he, he was converted, he got saved, he got baptized, he got filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week. Those things gave him the opportunity, the power, the, the tools that he needed to bring forth this word as well as his history, his, his upbringing, the things that he had went through. Galatians 2.9 says, Paul was given the right hand of fellowship by Peter, James, and John to preach the gospel. The salvation and sanctification only comes through Jesus Christ and baptized Gentiles. They told him, yes, you get to go do this. So the right hand of fellowship, that was, that was essentially their way of saying, I dub thee able to go do this with our blessing, our covering to go do it. That's what the right hand of fellowship means. We could get way deeper into the, into the uh, history of that, but we're not going to for time's sake. Galatians 2, 11 through 21 is when Paul confronts Peter at Antioch to his face. This is Peter, Peter, that Jesus says on you, I'm going to build my, my church. You are the rock, the foundation that I'm going to build my church on. Well, Peter started falling back into the whole um, ritual side of everything. After everything he had went through with Jesus, after everything Jesus had taught him, after everything he knew about salvation comes through Christ, he starts going back, going back into, the, into Israel, right? Going back into, um, not Israel, into Egypt, into, into slavery, into bondage of things that he must do. So much so that it was even... It was even making um, some, of, some of Paul's followers start to think that they had to do these things. And it was really frustrating, Paul. So he went and confronted Peter to his face. I think that Peter was probably a pretty fiery individual. Um, but fortunately, through God's grace, he, uh, he had probably overcome a lot of that. But I, I told you that because he wasn't afraid to, to confront when things needed to be confronted. He wasn't afraid to go to the, um, to the people that he knew he was going to get beat by. He wasn't afraid to go to the people that already love Jesus too, you know, that are kind of stepping off the path. He's going to them and saying, hey, listen, this is what's right. We know this is what's right. You know this is what's right. Let's get back into what God's called us to. The guy, he was truly walking in the Holy Spirit power, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and allowing God to use him through that. And we know that God specifically called him to do those things because God himself tells us that that's what he called him to do. Paul's main message was Jesus's death, resurrection, and the lordship of Jesus Christ. That was his, his overarching message. 
Okay, he wanted people to have a relationship with God, and he loved them so much, so much, that he was willing to endure all these hardships, all these hard things, so that people that didn't know Jesus could come to know Jesus, no matter what that cost was. And it was very, very painful. Ephesians 5.8 says, For you were once darkness. You were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. So this is, I'm getting ready to read a passage here that really just stood out to me so much. Because it shows Paul's heart. It shows um, his compassion and his, and his love for people um, and his willingness to bring truth to them. So it says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Get them out in the light. It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That's a little bit different translation. That was the NIV, so there's, there's a couple different translations. But I wanted to use this one specifically because he's, he's laying it out there. He says, everything that is exposed to the light becomes light. It's reflecting the light. If you look at the wall up here, you can see that that's the light, but the light's shining on the wall and it's reflecting more light. It would have been in darkness. It would have been in shadows. What he's saying is these deeds that we do in our lives these things that are buried deep in our hearts that we don't want other people to see that are shameful and that are disgusting. We don't want anybody to see it, so we hide it. We try to cover it up, right? But the thing is, is what he's really saying here is if you allow it to be exposed, if you bring it out into the light, then God's going to use that to be a light to other people. Just like what I said, not the, not the act itself, but the redemption power of Jesus Christ is what makes it the light. We overcome the enemy by the word, uh, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. You know what that nastiness is? It's part of your testimony. It's you being able to see th say, this is where I came from. These are the crazy things that I did, but this is what God did for me. He saved me out of this. He released me out of this. Now I'm not that person anymore. It wasn't because of me, but it was because of what God did. God did through me, and that's exposing that light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then in how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. If you don't know what it is, it's right here. It's written down in His Word. From the very first page to the very back page is His will. And He will reveal it to you. The word says that if you lack wisdom, ask. If any man lacks wisdom, ask, and he's going to give it to us. So the Holy Spirit's going to reveal it to us, and we've got the word right here to help us decipher it and discern it. How does this apply to us? How can we use the examples that Paul lays out in, in several of his books and other people's writings about him, how can we utilize that to take to other people? How can we utilize it? So we can use it as confirmation that God has a purpose and a plan and a will for us, even if it doesn't look good, even if it doesn't seem fun, even if we're going through hard times. We can use this confirmation that, that God does love us and God absolutely does care about us, even when we're going through times that it doesn't seem like it. We can use it as an example of how to be obedient to the calling of God in our life. We can say, hey, I'm going through some stuff, but at least I'm not going through what Paul went through. You know, there's, there's a little bit of hope, right? 
We can use it as, as a tool to get on the right path and follow the right path and allow God to work in us no matter what that looks like. I'm not saying we all need to be Paul. We obviously don't. We can't be, thank goodness. But we can use this life that, that he devoted every last bit of it to serving God. We can use that as an example of what to do in our own lives. What to do in our own lives. So there's a whole lot more um, to his writings, to his teachings and all that stuff. But I just encourage you guys to get in there for yourself. And then as you're going through it, you'll be able to, to pick out the things that he's saying that correlate with the Old Testament, the rest of the Bible, right? You'll be able to go back and see how it lines up with that stuff. You'll be able to see all the things that he's talking about now and how it, how it um, uh, came about throughout, uh, throughout the whole word. So none of this stuff is, uh, is not correct. It's all correct. You just have to be willing to get in and actually start to research it. Whenever you go, what? This doesn't make any sense. This is contradictive to this. No, it's not. I promise you it's not. Get in and study it a little bit. So I'm going to wrap up. And if anybody here today um, wants prayer for, for healing or for uh, encouragement or um, whatever it is, whatever it is, I encourage you guys to um, pray with one another. I encourage you to come up and get prayer. If you want to come up and get prayer from any of us, uh, most of the elders are here too. So please do that, but don't leave here today with any kind of question in your mind if you have a relationship with Jesus, if you are doing what he's called you to do. Don't leave with that question in your, in your mind or in your heart. Find out. If, if you feel like that God has called you to something and you just haven't stepped into it yet, today's the day. Step into it. Because life is a vapor. It is here today and gone tomorrow. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pray for you guys, and then we will uh, we'll go ahead and do some worship and close out. Um, during the worship time, if anybody has any needs, you know, just get, get together with one another, pray for each other. Um, if you need to go, you can go. But if you want to stay and, and get into some more worship, definitely do that too. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the word that you have uh, allowed us to receive today, God. I pray that we will all take the word into our hearts and into our minds and that we will use it, uh, apply it to our lives. And God, I pray for everyone here, Lord, that you will open up all of our minds to a deeper revelation of the true uh, purposes and plans that you have for our lives, God. Give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom and the knowledge and the, the obedience to go after full force, wholeheartedly for what you have for us, God. To go after you and to go after those that you love, Lord. Help us to love one another, live together in, in unity with one another, and help us to serve you well, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name.